Christmas. Man, here we are. We are just uh, a day, well, we're the eve of Christmas Eve, coming to you tonight to be able to share some uh, good news with you. And uh, so I'm honored to have uh, my daughter with me, Lauren Hockey. Lauren, welcome. It's always good to get to spend time with my daughter or daughters, and uh, it's good to get to do the, some of these uh, broadcasts with uh, Lauren as well. She always brings some really cool insight and uh, so I look forward to being able to share the evening with her and, and I'm thankful that you have allowed me to come into your well onto your phone wherever you might be whether it's in your home or if you are out somewhere else and you're watching the broadcast uh, so thankful that you allow us the time to be able to do that so we wanted to spend just a few minutes before I get into a couple of thoughts that I want to leave you with before you walk into your Christmas just a couple of things about our Christmases as well that through the years that we've been able to experience and enjoy. And I found that like every family has like traditions and certain things that they have done and things that kind of make them, you know, their family be what they are. And of course, you know what ours was for a long time. Many of the people might not know that I'm from Sandy Hook. I was raised in Sandy Hook, went to Elliott County High School. And uh, so my grandmother, my grandfather always, uh, as a little boy growing up, I always got to go to their house on Christmas Eve. And then on Christmas Day, we would open our presents at our house on Christmas Day. But Christmas Eve belonged exclusively to my grandmother. And listen, if you knew my grandmother, um, she this was the day she lived for she was like even as she got older you know she didn't do the, the shopping she'd have uh, Terry her daughter my aunt uh, to do the shopping but um, she lived for this day and she loved uh, us grandkids coming and then when you guys came along she loved you guys getting to come and and there was always like an, uh, enough food to feed an army and uh, so we always enjoyed getting to go that. And one thing I was, as we were talking before we came on, what was the one thing that you remember about that trip more than anything? Well, like over all the years that we went there, you know, until she passed away, Bree and I were younger, you know, at that time. <laughs> and every year, I on the way to Sandy Hook, there's a point where it turns into curvy roads and at that point every year I would get car sick and yeah. I just couldn't handle it so I remember that vividly and all through the years I think I think maybe you and Bree made every single trip till, till she did pass away except for one I think one year you guys were sick yeah. with the flu or something like that and you weren't able to make it but you know somewhere along the way through the years I always wanted you know as I got older I wanted to establish certain traditions for my family as well, and so now we've kind of taken on that role. We have a, a Christmas Eve uh, bash to where we open presents and enjoy company and have dinner and things like that, and now you're married, and so you'll start with some kind of tradition, and, and, uh, and Bree and Eli, you know, uh, they have their Christmas Day. They begin to create their Christmas Day traditions and so forth. But I suspect everybody has one of those. I'm kind of curious, what are yours? Um, what do you guys do? What Do you go to a, a grandparent's home, or do you, do you do yours at your house, or what does it look like? What, what is Christmas like at your house? What, what is it, uh, you know, what are the tr traditions that you've done? And I'd, we'd be curious to see that. Yeah, for sure. So the thing that we have to realize about Christmas is uh, as much as we all like presents and for me I I'll always in the past I've had a hard time of I always want especially with Debbie I get her a present especially if it's a good one mm -hmm. I always want to give it to her early <laughs> and I'm terrible at this kind of stuff because uh, you know I just have a hard time waiting I'm like open it open it and uh, it's kind of like the the family man that one place in the movie, yeah. you know. So, um, but we obviously center a lot of that around family, which is appropriate. 
and we always have gifts and things like that, which is fine. But I also think that many times, as the old adage has been, we do sometimes tend to forget about why that we do Christmas and what that really is all about. Yeah, I mean, you have to be intentional with everything, but, like, especially with something like that. Like, yes, we do the fun things, and all of that has its place, and it's great, but also have to be intentional about the reason as to why yeah and and I think that you know when you have your children you you begin to teach your children what the reality of it is is really all about even though you obviously keep it fun you know we were thinking about talking about Brie the other day when she was like three years old and the big thing was the three babies Mm -hmm. and uh you know and she just she I never forget that she she's like she saw the commercial and she told Debbie, she's like, Mommy, I want the three babies. I want the three babies. You know, and it was just so cute. And now she has her three babies, or she's got two, and she's got uh, the third one on the way. And so, you know, she's going to have her three babies. But she's already teaching them the traditions uh, of, of certain things. But she's also teaching them as well as, you know, the type of opportunities we have to have the influence as well. But we're all, as a family, are teaching them about Jesus as well. And because we want, when they grow up, we want them to understand, yes, Christmas is fun. And, and yes, the, you know, watch uh, Rudolph the Red-Nosed Reindeer and, and uh, you know, Santa Claus. And so, all that's fine, fun, all that. But then there does come the point where they have to really understand that's okay. But the real reason, you know, for Christmas is because of Jesus was born into the world. And so we all want to accomplish that. So I started thinking about this, and uh, I was looking back at the, the story here, the Christmas story, and we're, we're so familiar with this. And it's such a great story. I thought, maybe I'll just read a little bit of it. Let me, let me read a few verses here. So in, in Luke, I think that's always the best place for the Christmas story uh, to really get the insight of what was going on. It says in verse 26 in, in chapter 1, that in the sixth month, the angel Gabriel was sent to God, uh, sent from God into a city of Galilee, named Nazareth, to a virgin, a spouse to a man whose name was Joseph, of the house of David, and the virgin's name was Mary. And the angel came in unto her and said, "Hail, you are highly favored. The Lord is with you. Blessed are you among women." And when she saw him. She was troubled at his saying, and cast in her mind what manner of salutation that this should be. And the angel said unto her, Fear not, Mary, for you have found favor with God. And behold, you'll conceive in your womb, and bring forth a son, and shall, and shall call his name Jesus. And he shall be great, and shall be called the Son of the Highest. And the Lord God shall give unto you the throne, uh, give unto him the throne of his father David, and He shall reign over the house of Jacob forever, and of his kingdom there shall be no end. Then said Mary unto the angel, How shall this be, seeing that I know not a man? And the angel answered, and he said unto her, The Holy Ghost shall come upon you, and the power of the highest shall overshadow you. And therefore also that holy thing which shall be born of you shall be called the Son of God. And behold, your cousin Elizabeth has also conceived a son in her old age. And this is the sixth month with her who was called barren, for with God nothing shall be impossible. And Mary said, Behold, the handmaiden of the Lord, be it unto me according to your word. And the angel departed from her. So we see at least before his birth the prophetic word that he would be born, and then as he was uh, growing in Mary's womb. We see that Jesus was intended to be in the world um, to, to, to save the, the sins of the people. But even at that, we see the faith that was displayed in Mary's life that she reckoned, I mean, she didn't understand how. I mean, I, I guess that would freak anybody out, you know, like if somebody came to you, an angel came to you and said, you know, obviously a woman came to a woman and said, by the way, I have some interesting news for you. You're pregnant. And she's like, What? How, well, how could that be? I, I haven't. I'm a virgin. I, I haven't. I've not had. You know, I've not been with a man. I don't know a man. And and then he began explaining to her. But I love what her words were on verse 38 there when she said, 
Behold the handmaiden of the Lord. Be it unto me according to your word. I love that because it was like, I don't really understand it. I don't really know exactly how this worked. But you know what? What you said, I accept. And then we see over in uh, Luke chapter 2, the birth, uh, describing the birth of Jesus. Now this is really where I wanted to get to to jump into some thoughts here. It says, uh, verse 6, And so it was that while they were there, the days were accomplished that she should be delivered. And she brought forth the first son and wrapped him in swaddling clothes and laid him in a manger because there was no room for them in the inn. That's such a significant part of the birth of Jesus that I have found. And we'll talk about that in just a minute. And there were in the same country shepherds being uh, abiding in the field, and they kept watch over their flock by night. And lo, the angel of the Lord came unto them, and the glory of the Lord shone around, uh, shone round about them, and they were sore afraid. And the angel said unto them, Fear not, behold, I bring you good tidings, great joy, which shall be to all people. For unto you is born this day in the city of David a Savior, which is Christ the Lord. And this shall be a sign unto you that you'll find him wrapped in swaddling clothes, laying in a manger. So I was thinking about this, and I was thinking about this story, and I thought, yes, Jesus had to come into the world to save the world because we know that sin had come into the world and it required a, a perfect, sinless person to come and to die sinless. He had to die sinless in order to win back what was lost through the... Uh, the decision that Adam had made. We know that for sure. And that was the, the, the ultimate purpose, the ultimate you know, reasoning for, for Jesus coming. But there were also things that are wrapped up in that that I saw in the nature of God. And so I wanted to just kind of share a little bit about that and get your, your take on this. So in John chapter 3, verse 16, it says, For God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten Son that whoever believes in him would not perish but have everlasting life. So, number one, I see that God, his reasoning was, yes, to save the people, humanity, from their sin. But why? Why did he care? Was that really such a significant thing? I mean, okay, he makes a creation. Couldn't he have just said, well, that particular project didn't work out that great. Well, you know what? They get whatever they deserve. They had a chance. All they had to do was listen to me. And uh, Adam chose to do something different. And you know what? Now now he's producing the seed of sin and every person thereafter. And there's nothing I could... I mean, I could do something, but I ain't going to. He, I mean, he could have said that. But the reasoning for Jesus, or for God, to send Jesus, yes, was to, 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 to stop the sin cycle so man could be saved. But why? And so I think he tells us, shows us uh, here that the, the, the reasoning in that was because he loved his creation. And I know we love certain things. I mean, especially like babies. You know, you're, you're my child. You're my first, firstborn daughter. And, uh, and so there's, there's very few things in this life that I wouldn't do for you. You know that. And, uh, and I love you. You're a creation, so to speak, of me and your mother. I mean, I know you came from God, but we were, we were part of the part of the process. Part of the, process. Part of the process. And so I love you. And, uh, and then that's it because we're like God. You know, he told us that we've been created in his image after his likeness. So we have the, generally the, the type of nature that God has. And so one of those things is we love our creations. Fathers, mothers love their creations. We get that from God. And so we love our children. Now, the day will come, you know, sometime in the future that you'll have a child. And when you have a child, you're going to see, like, I love that child. I'll do almost anything for that child. And I believe that it gives credence when you have children. It opens up a whole different perspective for people to realize and, and kind of relate to God, if I could say it like that. You, you see that? Yeah. I mean, I've thought about it, like, with, you know, seeing other people around me who have children and stuff. 
and at this point like not being able to relate to that yet you know or even just like knowing your parents have children obviously because you wouldn't be there if you know they didn't but um I don't know I just you kind of knowing that it is different you know and to be able to experience a little bit of like what how God views us it makes me wonder why everybody wouldn't want to have kids to be able to to understand more fully and on a personal level like what that's like to where we have a greater revelation of how he loves us Mm -hmm. could that be that maybe people just don't have that relationship with God Mm -hmm. so they I mean when you have a relationship with God you you know he loves you Mm -hmm. but when you have a child it becomes I think accentuated yeah and I think it would also add more or not more but it would add a greater level of understanding to know that he loved us so much that he gave his own child right and it's like like how could you do that right i mean i love people i love all right let me just say this i love the the people watching on facebook right now i love y'all there's a lot of things i do for you but one thing i i will not do for you i would not give you i would not give you for them Mm -hmm. i just wouldn't do it I love you, so, and and I and nobody could even. Ar- I mean, you could argue with me. Well, you don't love me. I do, but there are limits to my love for people. So when God was willing to give His only Son, it's like, well, it's like where our love is limited, His, his is not. <laughs> yeah, He's limitless in His ability to give us love, and to me that just like makes Him like super. I mean, I it's to say super cool is not. It's just not even a fair word. It's almost really indescribable to say how much that God loves us. But so the the one thing within His Jesus's birth that I see that really stands out to me is the love of God. Mm-hmm. How much that He loved us to be able to send His Son, and and what that really means. And the only way I can really truly relate to that is to have something similar. Mm-hmm. And so I look and I go, I I love them, but I won't give you for them. Yeah. I just wouldn't. Right. And but yet God did. Yeah. And so I was like, ah. And then we kind of actually have a picture of that in, uh, in uh, Abraham with Isaac yeah. when God asked Abraham to sacrifice Isaac and Abraham was willing to do it. That was a type and shadow of what God was going to do right. in the future. Yeah. But for most people, they, have, they would have a difficult time. Yeah. So the second thing that I saw, there's three things, by the way, the second thing that I saw in this is I was just kind of reading through the, the, the Christmas story. The second thing was humility. God is like, <laughs> like when you're like in charge, you're the man, so to speak. People tend to not be very humble when they are the man or the woman. The greater the power and the greater of the authority, people tend to lose their humility because they begin to real or think somehow or another it's them i did this in some ways i think it would be hard not to mm-hmm. you know yeah because you feel like i have achieved a certain status i've done this i worked hard my i'm smart i i, I made the good decisions i've helped my company or whatever it is if it's not that, not that it makes it right but I, I can have a level of understanding that it probably would be hard yeah so god is like the ultimate man you know he's the man i mean he's the he's the guy he's the one that he's i mean he can do anything but yet he allows his son to be born into the world not as a king in a palace not as this you know uh, 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 there was some hoopla yeah. because the glory of the lord shone down and the angels were Ah, you know they were singing and saying hey you know the son of God is born and he's and he's lying in a manger for a lot of people that would have been like yeah I don't think so because he's not going to be in a barn in a manger but yet God allowed him to be born in a manger which again I'm trying to relate this back to me in in within the Christmas story because it's it is about sending the Son of God in the world to stop the sin cycle so that man could be saved. But there's more to it than that. There's a description of what that meant. And number one, we see he did it because he loved us. Number two, he was willing to do it through humility. Because all the things that took place within the Christmas story are things that we can apply 
in our lives. So we should be able to look and go, wait just a minute, my love for humanity should grow at a minimum. I'm not giving up my children for other people, but my love can, can grow and, and I, can, I can develop that love you know, towards people and recognize that God loved you people so much that he was willing to do this for you. And if he loves you that much, then my goodness, then I need to love you as well. And then the other thing is what we're saying is I need to recognize that at times when my pride begins to rise and look, everybody does. If you ever tell me that you have somehow or another achieved to the status of no pride and you've got it whipped, you've got it beat, and it's, you know, you've got it under total control, then you have right then you have already fallen into the pride cycle because yeah. it never, you never, you never, you never like went over like it's done it's over yeah. you have it one way or another whether you think no i'm not prideful at all well you're prideful there it is. There it is. <laughs> and then if you're like well yeah i do struggle you do struggle with pride <laughs> like we all do we we all do and it's a daily battle it's a daily thing that we have to recognize but that's the good thing is you when you realize that it is prevalent in your life it makes you realize that i have to deal with this i can't allow this to overtake me and, and when God showed the humility of allowing Jesus to be born in a manger, I mean, that, like, says a lot to me. Mm -hmm. It says that God was trying to send me a message within the message. Yeah. The me I'm sending you a message that Jesus is going to die for your sins. And then the message within the message is, is, and by the way, once I deliver you, you need to recognize that, yes, you're special to me, but you, it's not within you. You're special because of what I did for you, not because of the fact that you did something. Yeah, right. So there's like that message within that message. So I love the story, that story. And to me, as you know, you know, they sometimes don't always know. You get the, you get the inside story. Pride is a, is a, a sensitive thing to me, and through the years they don't know this. But, um, and some people have irritated, and I probably have irritated you all. I've been very careful through the years to not use the words, and maybe I'm sure I have, and I've wanted to, because I did feel that thing on the inside where I was so pleased with you as a daughter, and so pleased with Bree as a daughter, and, and so pleased with Matt as, a, as my stepson, or Tiff, or Amanda at different times, for different things. You know, I've, I've wanted to say that, to do that, but I've, and not that I would have been, that it would have been like wrong, but I've been so careful to judge myself to make sure that I don't let myself get into pride over the thing that would be the easiest to get into pride over is your children. Because mm -hmm. so many people are like, I'm so proud of my children. They do this. But, and I, don't, I didn't mean to get into this to this depth, but I'll just say this and we'll move on. Pride in your children, you have to, that to me, is one of the most dangerous. Because why are you proud of your children? Is because you know they came from you. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And like the thing about it, like at first I think it was probably annoying. Like, no, I'm not going to say I'm proud of whatever, whether it be us or anything in life. But also, like the Bible's very clear. It literally says God resists the proud, and it's like, well, then I wouldn't want to be something that God resists. In any capacity, right? Even even it's well-meaning, mm -hmm. right? Yeah. You know, I'm proud to be an American. I mean, that's well-meaning. Yeah. We mean well, and we and, and I'm so happy to be an American. Mm -hmm. I really am. I, I I look and I go. It it is, at least what I've seen, the greatest place on the earth, mm -hmm. with the greatest freedoms and 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 possibilities and things like that. But that said, if you're not careful, it can turn into the idea that somehow or another that you think that an American is a more important or better life person than somebody from another nationality. Yeah. yeah. So No, uh, I get it. I you I think you have to be careful with that. And I think people inadvertently fall in to pride not wanting to and not knowing they're doing it, but our words are powerful and like we say those words are proud or whatever and that becomes part of us yeah and to say I would I'm proud of you in and of itself is not wrong 
that that's not that has never been my point it was it was more like I don't want to get in the habit of using a word that ultimately could cause me to fall into that and so I've chose to use the words that I saw God himself use when when uh, when Jesus was baptized you, you guys know that when he's baptized God had a perfect opportunity it was like the moment if he ever wanted to use that, yeah. he could have done it. And there's a, a reason why he didn't. Yeah, because he could have said, this is my beloved son and whom I'm, whom I'm very proud of. Mm -hmm. But he chose a different word. And again, I know it's sometimes semantics because we, we really do mean that, mm -hmm. not, not that we're proud. So I, I, I want to distinguish that. I know that that's, generally speaking, many people's uh, perspective when they say that they're proud of their children. I just, it's, uh, it's a slippery slope. Yeah. And that's why I try to stay away from it. But God didn't use the word. He said, this is my beloved son in whom I'm well pleased. And in fact, if you look in the Bible, you'll never see the word proud used in a good sense. Mm -hmm. It's always used in a negative sense. Yeah. So anyway, so humility, that is a representation of God, love and humility. Yeah. Instead of bringing him into a very like extravagant way he chose a very humble way yeah and when you see that you go that he's he's kind of telling me something within the big message he's also giving me another lower message then the third thing that i saw was this in genesis 3 chapter 14 it says the lord god said unto the serpent because you've done this you're cursed above all cattle and above every beast of the field upon your belly you'll go and the dust You'll eat all the days of your life, and I'll put enmity between you and the woman, and between your seed and her seed, it is seed, God's seed, shall bruise your head, and you shall bruise his. Now notice that, his heel. Now who was he talking about there? He was obviously prophesying Jesus to come, mm -hmm. that the seed of God would bruise the head of Satan, and Satan's heel would, or I'm, I'm sorry, uh, that uh, Jesus' heel would, would bruise his head. So in other words, his foot is on the devil. So God was prophesying Jesus to come. He was saying there's going to come a time that, you're, that this is going to get undone. Mm -hmm. And so what I thought about when I saw that, I thought of this. God's word is full of integrity what G, what God said has come to pass mm -hmm. he doesn't just say things flippantly we tend to we tend to say things and 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 sometimes we just rattle off that's why that he tells us to be careful about the words that we say because uh, he's uh, every idle word we're going to take have to be accountable for every idle word and sometimes we say stuff and it's like we're just talking. We have to, I think, be careful because we say things or I'll take care of that for you. And you know, if I'm going to be, you know, sometimes I'm going to be a few minutes late, two or three minutes, I might not, it might not be a big deal. But if, I, if I'm running a little bit late, I'm, I'm going to text or call and say, listen, I, I'm running a little bit. I want to let you know. Or if when we start a church service, listen, folks, this is one of my pet peeves. One of my pet peeves, you take it or leave it, I mean, whatever you think. My, one of my pet peeves is if we say that church starts at 1030, we don't start at 1033. We don't start at 1035. We don't casually have some conversation out here. If we say we start at 1030, then we start at 1030 yeah. because it's an integrity issue to me. Mm -hmm. It's like um, going to the grocery store and you have a cart folks you know what I'm talking about you get your cart if it's you don't don't type on your comment section that's me <laughs> we're not looking to find out who you are we're just making a statement to me it's like when you put your cart you get done taking your groceries out and you leave your cart just sitting there in the in the parking lot to me that is an integrity issue the, the thing for me I, that I'm personally very careful about, like whenever people put on Facebook, like they're asking for prayer for something, and then I see like this like long list of people saying, praying for you, praying for prayers, prayers for you, praying for you. I don't ever write, or I'm very cautious to write, I'll be praying for you, mm -hmm. or yeah. I'm praying for you, prayers. 
because most I've I, in the past I've done that before and then I realized I totally forgot to do that mm -hmm. so like if ever I'm like scrolling or whatever and I see someone who's asking for prayer and I want to pray for them I typically will write out like You're what praying. exactly I'm praying for them because mm -hmm. I don't want to accidentally say hey I'm praying for you and then totally forget about it absolutely and one thing that, that is helpful in that, I haven't, I can't say that I've always done that, but I try to do it every chance that I can. If it, and I know exactly the situation that you're talking about because you say I'm praying for you, and then you, you know, the it's an three days thing. go by. Yeah, three days go by, and you go, I forgot to pray for them. And or you ever had somebody come up and say, Thank you for, I know you were praying for me, and you went, I forgot. You asked me to pray for you, and I forgot. Don't lie. I know you've done it too. So one of the ways to rectify that is just if you can, when you see that, if you're in a moment where you can do it, it doesn't have to be a long, it doesn't have to be like this long drawn out thing. Mm -hmm. You can just say, Father, this person has ask, is asking for prayer right now that they need healing to be restored to their body. I ask you to minister to them. Just bring to their remembrance all the scriptures, you know, and just say something. It doesn't have to be you know, this long drawn out thing. Many times we pray long prayers because we think that we are, somehow or another, the longer it is, the more fervent we do it, it'll make it better because, after all, this is what we do. We're good at this. Yeah. The reality of it is, is this. We are just connecting that person's thoughts with our thoughts to God. Yeah. And sometimes it can be just as simple as, Father, I ask you to be involved in their situation you said you took your, their infirmities and bore their sicknesses. Now I've released my faith that that's really what happened. Now I bless them in Jesus' name. Yeah, and then you can write, just prayed for you. And, yes. and then it's totally true. Yes, <laughs> you know? yes. And, and, and sometimes people will say, uh, just keep praying for me. And most of the time, I'll just be honest with you, it's like, no. Uh, in many, I've had people say, will you, will you pray for me every day? And I'm like, no, I won't. I don't want to lie. No, I won't because I'm not going to do that. I'd, first of all, I don't have the mental capacity to keep up with that every day. I've already got enough going on in my life. And then secondly, and more importantly, is it's against uh, faith. When you pray the prayer of faith, if I come back and pray it again, was I praying in faith the first time? So once I've prayed for you, I have to trust that that prayer is operating and working. And I just, because I believe in the integrity of God's word. And so if I pray in faith, now if I recognize that maybe I wasn't in faith, I might go back and go, you know what, I, I, I didn't really say. I've had to actually interrupt my prayer because I'd get sidetracked in my prayer and because my mind was like going different directions. And I've had to stop and go, right, wait just a minute. God, scratch everything I said. Let me get dialed back in. Let me refocus. And then I say, Father, forgive me for that. In the name of the Lord Jesus, I come to you. And then I get right back in my, my thought process. But it is an integrity thing. Yeah, and I mean, then at that point, in that scenario, it'd be more appropriate, like, pray the prayer, but then revisit it in the sense that you're thanking the Lord for hearing you, thanking Him for yes. responding, for being with that person, whatever. Exactly. Nothing wrong with coming back to that and thanking Him. Lord, I just wanted to bring back to your remembrance, brother so-and-so, sister so-and-so, Thank you. I, I prayed for them. I know I prayed the prayer of faith, and Father, I just thank you that you're ministering to them. They're they're getting better every day, every every hour. They're yeah. recovering. It, a line, I mean, back to the integrity thing of God being an, an integrity God. It brings your mind in alliance with knowing Him to be full of integrity. You know yeah. that He is true to His word. That He is hearing you based upon what we know in Scripture. You know. Right. So if God's a God of integrity, then we should be people of integrity. And uh, so the three things, ultimately, that I got out of this is obvi obviously the obvious. You know, we know that. Jesus came to the world to, to die for our sins and to be the sacrifice for all, all of humanity. But three things within that. He showed his love. That was his real driving motivation to send Jesus was his love for us. Number two... He showed us a way how to live in, in Jesus coming into the world, not in a, in a castle or in a, you know, a, a palace or anything like that. He came into the world as a baby in a manger. And so don't, don't feel like that your life somehow or another has to be all full of 
frills and you know riches and things nothing wrong with being blessed but but when you're blessed make sure that you recognize you keep it you keep a humble spirit and recognize that it it really your blessing didn't come just because you're so smart it came because god gave you the wisdom to be able to, to have that understanding yeah. and then the last thing was uh he's a god of integrity he said he prophesied that jesus would come and when he said it don't you know that the devil knew good and well uh-oh mm -hmm. he and, knew yeah and you can use that knowing he's true to his word in the sense of like that he brought jesus into the world for us that he was going to crush or bruise his foot on his head knowing that and being you know confirming that in your mind and in your heart and your spirit it can also build confidence in you for other things that the yeah, lord has that's been great you know has said like directly pertaining to your life or whatever it is that you're believing for. right right because if you if you adhere to the integrity of his word and see that he prophesied jesus would come what he said he meant what he meant he said and jesus did in fact come we know that it came to the world we know that well why would he if he's not a man that he should lie then why would any place in his word not not be true yeah because if he's integrity if he shows integrity about one thing he shows it about everything yeah. it's not just it's not a pick and choose thing all of his word is true it was true for that then the rest of it's true amen i know we went a little bit long but uh, i hope you've enjoyed this um i love talking about christmas i love christmas i love the the gifts and i love watching the babies i love seeing them open the gifts it'll be fun get, this year too <laughs> <laughs> well bell's gonna be i know she's gonna be so excited i just remember back the three babies and all that and how the excitement and all that kind of stuff and and you, there was times different things when you were i remember uh, one year I when I got my uh, it wasn't my first bicycle but, but it was my first cool bicycle it was like it looked like a motorcycle and I was like man I think if I remember it correctly it was green and it was like you know knobby tires on it and it was just like man I thought I was like the coolest kid in the world at that time and that just just because I know that my parents loved me and wanted to bless me but um, it'll be a fun time but just don't forget have fun enjoy your family eat lots of good food be a blessing to your kids and your grandkids but just don't ever forget that this was the reason that we get together and uh, God loves you he's a humble God and he wants you to be humble and he's a God of integrity and he wants you to be a person of integrity and I know if you'll live by those standards it'll serve you well for the rest of your life anything you want to say before we leave no, all right well praise God listen Merry Christmas to you and uh, come back next week. We'll be getting ready for a New Year's message. I believe God's going to give me something that is uh, ready to start the new year off. And then if you can, come on, on uh, in-person services. I know as we get ready, I've got some things churning in me about what uh, I believe that the message is going to be to get uh, 2021 started off the uh, first uh, part of maybe mid-January. I'm going to have some things for you that I know that the Lord is going to bless you with. So God bless you. Thank you for watching. Thank uh, all the Kingsway Church people. Thank you for all your support throughout 2020. I know it's been a tough year. I know 2021 is going to be much better, but thank you for your support. We love you. We appreciate you, and we're looking forward to being back with you, and we're praying tonight that God's very best will be yours. Amen.